How's it going, everyone? It's been a while since we've done one of these, but some of you are blowing me up in the comments about having another cooking segment, and it's been a while, like I said, so we're gonna do kind of the opposite of what a normal video is, in which usually we'd have gameplay and game commentary, and then a cooking segment in the middle. This is gonna be cooking segment with a bit of gameplay mixed in to help extend the time. Just in case you're illiterate and somehow found your way onto this video, or you just blindly clicked when you saw a slab of meat on the cover of the thumbnail, we're making BL BLTs today, but not just any BLTs, we're making the best BLTs that we can possibly make. So here's what we're gonna need. I'm gonna list off all the ingredients before we get started for everything involved in this. We're gonna need burger buns, or if you're feeling fancy ciabatta rolls, I wanted to do the ciabatta, but both of the grocery stores I usually go to are not bougie enough to have that in the bakery section, so we're just doing whatever these are, the artisanos. I, they're kinda cheap to the point where I'm kinda worried, like maybe they're cutting corners, but they get the job done. Don't do traditional square sliced bread because that's not gonna be able to soak up enough juices. Next, we're obviously going to need bacon. We're going to need two kinds. We're going to need the center cut kind, preferably the thinnest bacon you can find. And then we're gonna need the thick stuff, the dummy thick stuff. Get that extra thick cut, the stuff that's less of a thick cut of bacon and more like an extremely thin cut of pork belly. That stuff is gonna come into play later. We're also going to need a head of romaine lettuce, one meaty beefsteak tomato, and then we're gonna need all the ingredients for our guacamole spread, which is going to be avocados, duh. We're going to need lime. We're going to need a can of banana peppers, or a jar, I should say. We're going to need some Mexican green onions and salt and pepper to taste. Now, as for the equipment you're going to need, I'm just gonna list these off in no particular order. You're going to need a 14 inch frying pan. If you don't know if it's exactly 14 inches, just grab the big one in your kitchen, that'll do. Then you're going to need like an oven pan, like the kind you'd bake something with. You're going to need a drying rack. You're going to need a pair of tongs for flipping that bacon. And uh, let's see here, you're also going to need a bowl, maybe two bowls, depending on how you're feeling, a good old fashioned kitchen knife, some kitchen shears, or basically those scissors that you get in every set of kitchen knives ever. If you have one of those blocks, you have a set of kitchen shears. A cutting board for your veggies, a few plates to put everything on, and lastly, you're going to need a couple ramekins for reserving the bacon fat. This is a very important part of it, even if you decide not to use the bacon fat later on, and we'll get into that in a minute. All right, first orders of business are washing. First, Wash your little oven pan very thoroughly. Get that thing cleaned really well because there's probably a lot of grease on it already or God knows what. Then dry it really well, set it aside, put your cooling rack on top of it. Then while you've got the sink running, wash all your vegetables. Just get that done because we want to get these drying and nice and dry by the time we finally cut them and put them in the sandwiches. Once you've got everything washed and dried, you're gonna wanna start heating up your pan. What I like to do to make sure my pan is like heating up properly is I intentionally leave just a little bit of water inside the pan when it starts heating up. And then when I see that all the water is evaporated or another drop of the water evaporates really fast, that pan is hot. And this is the best thing to do like if you're a little squeamish about sticking your hand right on top of the pan. Some people are like that, I get it. It takes a long time to get comfortable with that. So this is a good method for you as long as you are very careful because hot steam can also burn you. Now for the more obvious part, we're going to start frying up the bacon. We're gonna start with that skinny stuff, the center cut pieces of bacon. The thinner you can find this stuff, the better. Now this stuff, you can do three or four, or even five or six at a time because it's really thin and there's not a lot of grease inside these things. You're gonna want it on a high heat because we're frying it and uh, just, one turn and then after a while it's done. And what you're gonna wanna do between batches of bacon is once one batch or pan full, whatever you wanna call it, is done, take it off the heat, carefully, carefully put the bacon onto the cooling racks to rend the fat, like get whatever dripping is off. And then with the utmost of care, take your pan and pour out the drippings into one of those ramekins that you had earlier. This is gonna be really handy later on, especially if we're doing a large amount of bacon for sandwiches because that fat will build up in the pan. And not only is that a massive burn hazard, and trust me, as somebody who's had second degree burns from grease before, they are a nightmare to heal, but also we can use this later on as the best cooking grease you have ever used. 
Additionally, you're gonna wanna keep on pouring out all the fat between batches of bacon because otherwise it's gonna be too full and you're not gonna get very crispy bacon because you're basically going from pan frying to deep frying and eh, that's not particularly good on sandwiches. All right, now remember to let your pan heat up a little bit between batches, like maybe give it a minute to get back up to full heat. And it's usually a good idea to, once you've done the most recent batch, take the last batch that's on the cooling rack and turn it over so the grease on that side can drip off. And also by the time another batch is done, the bacon is usually cool enough to touch with your hands. You wash your hands before this, right? Now, even though bacon is a relatively quick fry, usually taking five minutes or less depending on how hot you like your pans, this is gonna take a while because we got a lot of bacon. So I'm gonna go over some stuff from the VTMB video that didn't quite make the cut for the final video, but I still thought was pretty interesting. To start, the original three of Troika games never strayed too far from each other. A couple of them went to Obsidian, one of them went to Blizzard for a while. There was also a time when another one of them went to Carbine Studios, the uh, game development house behind, what was that, Wildstar. And all of these studios? are within about five miles of each other. It's nice to know that all of them were able to land on their feet and stay in the game industry, especially after we've gotten all these reports over the years of just how outright vile of an industry it is and how short-lived most careers in game development are. Now for a little more on-topic stuff about Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, let's do a quick recap of all the things that have happened since the events of Bloodline to kind of give us an idea of what's going on. The uh, most I guess, prominent thing. Uh, by the way, if this is rambly, I'm sorry. I don't write scripts for these videos for cooking because whatever, is that there was something called the Second Inquisition, which TLDR on that was a secret service agency was able to hack their way into Shreknet, the Nosferatu like dark web internet thing. And they're like, oh crap, vampires are real. They don't call them vampires by name. They call them, I believe, cold targets based on like how they don't have a heat signature because they're already dead. But after that, all the secret organizations, quasi-governments of the world got together and were like, this is a problem. We need to deal with these vampires, but we're not calling them vampires. So they attack the Prime Tremere Chantry in Vienna and they blame it on ISIS. Uh, this pretty much uh, screws over most of the vampire community, particularly the Tremere. As the Tremere have what's called the Pyramid, something that Maximilian Strauss alludes to, which is basically a massive network of blood lines. Blood bonds. Blood bonds. That's the word I was looking for, which allows for the Tremere to have an organization among their peers, and that's how they keep their secrets. If everyone is blood bound to each other, it's very hard for somebody to break that and go blabbing about their magical abilities. Now that the main chantry sort of collapsed and most of the pyramid with it, if there are any remaining chantries, they're kind of scattered and they're not exactly in the best position. Additionally, on top of that, the Camarilla wasn't doing so well either. If you remember from Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, the Gangrels had just left the Camarilla because they just weren't feeling it. They were kind of, not to be too hammy, but lone wolves already. But on top of that, now, certain sects of the Bruja are leaving the Camarilla too because they're not feeling it either. And you know, if you talk to your typical Bruja in Bloodlines, it makes perfect sense why they wanna up and leave the Camarilla. In response to this, it seems that Camarilla Brass is now trying to recruit the La Sombra clan into the Camarilla. However, they're more Sabat aligned. And also, uh, you probably didn't see a La Sombra in your playthrough of Bloodlines, unless you had the plus patch, and then unless you did the special quest that was added in after the fact to Vampire the Masquerade. Lastly, to round this all out before the skinny bacon's done, as some of you likely know already, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines is not the only Vampire the Masquerade video game or World of Darkness video game. In addition to Bloodlines, there's also Vampire the Masquerade Redemption, which is a more traditional RPG and less of an immersive sim. Additionally, there is also a trilogy of games for the seventh generation, excuse me, sixth generation of consoles, kind of traipsing into seventh generation 
generation later on called the Hunter series, where you play as the vampire hunters that harassed you in Bloodlines. This is a trilogy of games where no one game is on the same console as the others, and it's kind of a loose, kind of devil may care plot slapped together. Basically, you're three prisoners that got executed, but it turns out the prison is ran by vampires, and it's very likely that the guy that is the final boss is a Zimitsi. By the way, I learned how to pronounce that right. Sorry, guys. Alrighty, so the batch of center cut bacon is done, and you've been rending out all that fat from the pan, right? Okay, now if you like your bacon chewy, then you're done with this batch of bacon. However, because we want to have crunch and meatiness in our bacon, we're going to take all this bacon and we're going to fry it a second time now that the bulk of the grease and fat is out. This is going to be really fast. This stuff is already cooked through. We're just trying to crisp it. So if it isn't already, put your pan up to full heat and then you only need about 30 to 45 seconds on each side for the center cut bacon to give it that extra crisp. Once that's done, put it all back on the rack to get rid of whatever is left of that fat. And we're moving on to the thick stuff. Now this stuff we have to treat entirely different from the center cut bacon because it's like what four, five, six times the thickness of the stuff we were handling previously. So do maybe two or three strips tops while you're cooking this stuff at any given time. As you can see by this little cut here, one pan full of the thick cut stuff rends out as much fat as our entire package of the center cut bacon. So we don't want to get too crazy with this stuff if we want our bacon to be edible. Other than that, it's the same story as the center cut bacon. Cook it once on each side, set it aside onto a rack to get rid of fat drippings, give it a minute between batches, make the next batch, and so on. Now, I personally did not fry this stuff a second time, mainly because I was short on time myself. I started this cooking late, and my wife had just gotten home, and she was pretty hungry from doing a full shift at work. So I was like, you know what? We're just gonna have this stuff be a little extra meaty and savory, and we're gonna have it friable for a second time. By the way, Save the bacon from whatever you don't use in this because especially like if you do meal prep or something and you're looking for just maybe less than 50 calories to make sure your chicken's extra tasty, a half strip of bacon diced up real fine is a great way to make something mediocre become really tasty without adding too much excess calorie and fat. Now, once all your extra thick bacon is done and it's on the rack, Give it a few minutes to uh, cool off and then get those cooking shears you mentioned earlier, or I mentioned earlier, excuse me, and you're gonna need to trim this stuff. Now, mainly just get rid of those big fat pieces. If you want, you can still keep those in, but remember these are pure fat, so there's only so much you can do with it. And additionally, cut up all the bacon to where it will fit easily on your bun. You don't want this stuff sticking out because then the grease goes down the side of the bun and it gets all mushy and nasty. Same story with your thin cut bacon, which is nice and crispy now. Cut it in half so that it fits just right on the sandwich. Once you have everything cut up and ready to go, put it on a plate and set that sucker aside because we need to do our buns and accoutrement. Is accoutrement the right word for this stuff? I I'm not sure. Alrighty, it's time to make that guacamole and then finish this sucker up. So I'm not gonna get too into the guacamole recipe here because this is basically you suck at cooking's guacamole recipe. Like it's his first video he ever did. And I'm just gonna name the differences I do if you wanna do it like my way. However, I cannot recommend enough checking out that video. It was like the first thing he ever did and one of the best. And the channel in general is great if you wanna make like simplistic but kind of quirky cooking things. The only differences I do is instead of doing normal green onions, I use Mexican green onions, which are a bit more bulbous. And what I do instead of the weird cutting thing is I slice them finely. And then once I have about the yield I want, I take that and I run it through a couple times, which if you don't know what running through is, it's basically when you rapidly cut something with no measurement to get a sort of fine, but somewhat inconsistent particulate, or is that the right word? I don't know. And it's really good in this case for guacamole where we want it to be kind of chunky. Then, other than that, instead of just pure lime juice, I use one part lime juice to one part of the juice from the jar of the banana peppers. Lastly, I don't do it in this particular batch of guacamole because this was for my wife, is uh, sometimes I'll add a pinch of cayenne and a squirt of sriracha to give it a bit of a kick, but not enough to where the color is noticeable in the final product. It's kind of a funny thing now that I think of it. For some reason, I get like this spider sense, this sort of charl tingle whenever my 
wife has had a bad day at work, and I know to make the guacamole because that seems to be like one of her favorite things. I can't quite explain how I know this. I think it's like a spouse thing that like you just get in tune to after a while. By the way, now would be a good time to start toasting up your buns, which you don't need to get too crazy with this. Just set it to like the lowest setting. You just want it like kind of warm and crispy. You don't want to get too burnt because otherwise you're going to have problems properly absorbing all the juices. And now it's time to plate up. So this is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to run through the proper build order of these sandwiches because if you do it wrong, um, I'm so sorry. So start with the bun, like the bottom bun, and then add whatever sauces you want to add. I go for a little bit of sriracha because I like my stuff spicy, my wife not so much. Then comes the thick bacon, like the real thick stuff. Maybe about two strips worth here because this stuff, it's like already pretty meaty and you don't want to make your stuff too chewy. Then add the lettuce. I chop my romaine sideways like this because it makes nice convenient strips to just layer on top. Once you have a decent layer of lettuce on these suckers, then comes the tomato. If you can get away with it, just have that nice thick cut from the middle of the beefsteak tomato and that is going to be excellent if you can get full coverage with one slice that is optimal here i'm using like a tomato that i had from a previous meal cook whatever and i had to do parts then you put on your thin bacon this stuff is going to be nice and crispy and crunchy and because it's not directly below anything soggy it's going to stay that way so to recap we've got bun sauce thick stuff lettuce tomato crispy bacon, and then finally, spreading it directly on the top bun, put a somewhat healthy dollop of that guacamole on top. And that's gonna act as like, not only a nice additional different kind of fatty flavor, but that's gonna be the glue that holds everything together. Pop that on top, give it the gentlest of squeezes, cause you don't wanna mash anything down too much, and then garnish with some chips or something. All right, awesome. We're all done and plated up. We wanna see a cross section? Well, too bad, that's binging with Bavish's thing, and I don't like ripping people off, so go bother him if you want to see something like this in a cross section. This is definitely a once in a while meal because it's extremely fatty as it is, but it's a nice treat every now and again. Uh, that's gonna do it for today. Like, if you really want to know, I'll just summarize. The only formal cooking training I have is my senior year of high school. I took an introduction to culinary arts because I had a gap period that they said I had to fill, and my wife and I really like watching cooking shows on YouTube. We're a big fan of Binging with Babish. We like You Suck at Cooking. We like anything from Bon Appetit that has Claire Saffitz in it. And other than that, I'm just drawing on some really basic experience from a few fast food jobs I've had, like at juice bars, or I worked at a deli for a while, and that really taught me about different kinds of cheeses and like how to do fancy meats and charcuteries. But uh, I'm rambling a little too much for this video. I already see it's running over time. So I'm gonna leave it at this. Thank you all so much for bearing with me here. This is kind of a fan service thing for a very select few of you. Gaming videos resume tomorrow. Uh, sign off are stupid and I don't know how to do them. So enjoy the cat video. Oh. Who might be in here? Hey Max, long time no see.